Hey guys, it's Krista Watson here from Krista Quilts, and on this week's machine quilting video, I'm gonna dive in deep and talk to you about how I made this quilt behind me called Sparkling Stars. It's made for my Stitchy Fabric Collection, which is a beautiful assortment of five different prints in five different colorways for a beautiful collection of 25 prints. Now this particular quilt, Sparkling Stars, actually uses all 25 fabrics in the collection. But of course, you can pick and choose any fabrics that you like. In the pattern itself, I include full colors, instructions, and diagrams, plus a coloring chart that shows you exactly where each of the colors needs to go. So if you wanted to make it super scrappy, you could pull fabrics from your stash, or you could use different fabrics in similar colors for a similar look. Now for the machine quilting, I quilted it completely on my domestic sewing machine using a walking foot or dual feed system. I quilted one of my favorite fast and fun go-to designs called Wavy Continuous Spiral. Now in my in-person classes that you might have taken from me, I teach both how to quilt a straight line continuous spiral and a wavy line continuous spiral. It's the same technique, but you just wiggle and wave as you quilt. This is one of the few designs that's most successfully done completely on a domestic machine. I wouldn't recommend trying this one on a long arm, but it's really fast, it's really forgiving, and the best part is there's very little marking. You start off with marking a center spiral, and then you wiggle and wave your way all the way around to form the design. Now, I show how to do this in person if you've taken a class from me and we practice on small samples. But many of my students wanted to say, well, how do I actually do that on a full-size quilt? So this video is the answer to that question. Let's take a look and you can see how I put this quilt together and how I quilted it, plus a few other tips and tricks. Once my units are cut according to the pattern instructions, I keep them organized so that I know that which fabrics go in each block. Then I use a small square ruler and marking pen to mark lines on the back of my fabrics according to the pattern instructions. When it's time to trim up the flying geese, I can do that right here at the sewing machine using my mini mat and ruler set. Be sure to check out my blog for a step-by-step -step tutorial on how to trim them without needing to use a flying geese ruler. I like to press all of my units open so they lay nice and flat, and I'm going to stack all the units together right next to my sewing machine so they're easy to assembly line sew. Here's what all of the finished blocks looked like. It was so fun to piece them together in this bright, bold color scheme. You can use similar colors or you can use the same stitchy fabric that I used. It really looks dynamic. Now there's definitely a lot of piecing and pressing that goes into making these blocks, but it's worth the effort for a stunning result. Probably my most used tool in my sewing room is my design wall. Again, check out my blog for a tutorial on how I made it. I love to lay out all of the blocks on my design wall, and then I'll take a picture of it with my phone as I join the rows together so that I keep everything organized. Because this has a radiating sparkling design, I kind of started in the center and put all the blocks around it, double checking my pattern to make sure that everything is in the right orientation. Now you can see all of those seams pressed open is really gonna make a difference when it comes to basting. When it's time to add the borders, I'm going to fold them in half and find the midway point. Then I will pin in the middle of the quilt and add additional pins so I can work out any fullness. I don't want to stretch this out of shape. Once the quilt top is finished, it's time to baste it. I'm using 505 basting spray and I'm spraying the layers outside. Then I'm going to assemble them on my design wall inside. So I'm going to start with the backing wrong side up and I'm going to let it just kind of drape over a table. I'm going to spray an even amount on the back of the quilt and then I'm going to repeat that process for the front of the quilt. Again, wrong side up, just lightly spraying that 505 spray. A little tip is you want to shake the can and make sure that it sprays cleanly and evenly before you start adding it to your quilt. Once the layers are sprayed, I'm gonna take it inside on my design wall again to assemble the layers. 
So first I'm gonna start with a quilt backing and you want this to be at least four to six inches bigger all the way around than the quilt top. My trick here is that I am pinning it to my design wall and letting gravity pull the weight of the quilt down to kind of work out most of the wrinkles. Then I'm using a long acrylic ruler to smooth out any wrinkles, any tucks, any puckers on the back. Now this ruler will get a little bit sticky, so I actually just have one ruler that I only use for basting and I use a separate one for cutting. You can also wash it off with warm soapy water. Once the backing is all flat and looks good, then I'm going to add the batting. Now, my favorite batting is Hobbs Tuscany Cotton and Wool Blend. It's going to cling to the quilt, reducing the chance that I'm gonna get puckers, and it's warm and cozy, and it really shows off the stitching really well. When you kind of find a couple battings that you like, you tend to use them in all your quilts, and that's how I feel about this batting. Again, the batting is roughly a little bit smaller than the backing, but it's definitely bigger than the quilt top. And again, I'm taking that long ruler to smooth everything out. The nice thing about this process is you can always reposition the layers, smooth it out, move things around if you need to. And then finally, I'm going to add the quilt top in the same way. Now you can see that my quilt top is a lot smaller, so I'm gonna trim off the excess when it's all done. But I'm going to take the time to smooth everything out, kind of block everything into place. I want my quilt top to look nice, and flat and square. So I will take a long time if I need to, but the whole basting process I can do in less than an hour. So once everything's nice and smooth and even and square, I'm going to take my batting scissors and I'm going to cut off the extra batting, leaving only about an inch or two around on all four sides. The extra batting and backing helped me line things up so I didn't have to match it up perfectly, but then I'm going to trim that away and those trimmings are going to be what I'm going to use to practice my quilting before I take it to the real quilt. I only leave a small amount of batting and backing around the edges of the quilt so that there's less bulk under the machine and so that it won't flip underneath itself while I'm machine quilting. Finally, here's the magic spot. What I do is I take my quilt that's been basted and I iron both sides of the quilt to kind of smush it all together and set the glue. I've got the quilt on top of my ironing board and I'm using a big board that lays right on top of the ironing board to give me lots of room. So once I press the backing, I'm going to press the top as well. This is a final chance to work out any wrinkles, make sure that the entire quilt is flat and clean and smooth and that's gonna make for a much better machine quilting experience. I'm going to quilt with one of my neutral colored gray threads in my piece and quilt collection of 50 weight Orofil 100% cotton thread. And I'm actually using the spool to help me mark the guideline for where to start quilting. I'm using my little ruler to make sure that I'm gonna start my circle right in the middle of the block. I want it nice and even. And then I'm going to use that spool of thread as my starting circle template. I'm just gonna trace around it with a washable pen and then I'm measuring about a half an inch away. That's going to represent the distance between the needle and the edge of the foot. The final thing I do is I add a little starting tail so that I can get a nice smooth starting spiral and I'm going to pull my threads up right where the two intersect. Because I'm starting my quilting where you're going to see it, I want to pull my threads up. I'm bringing my bobbin thread up to the top and then I'm going to lock my stitches in place with a series of six to eight teeny tiny stitches. I'm actually machine quilting this with my Bernina Dual Feed and Open Toe 20D Foot. This basically performs the same function as a walking foot. I'm following that center spiral around the quilt to get started. Now you can do this with a straight line, but in this particular instance, I am actually wiggling and waving my quilt back and forth to form a wavy line. It's a lot easier to follow and it's a lot more forgiving. You could do the same thing with a decorative stitch, but it's a little bit of a different look. The important part is as I move around the quilt, 
I'm keeping the edge of my foot next to the previous line of stitching so that I can keep my lines relatively even. Now again, because I'm wiggling and waving, it's not going to be necessarily even all the way around, but it'll kind of keep it spiraling in an organic but orderly manner. Now, as I make my way around that center spiral, it's going to take a little bit of time. A couple of features on my Bernina 770 QE really make this a lot easier. So the first thing is my needle is set to stop in the down position. That way when I rotate my quilt, it's not gonna make a big mess and it's not gonna slip underneath. I also mentioned that I'm using the open toe 20D foot. In order to make sure the foot is gliding on top of the quilt and not getting hung up or causing any puckers or tiny stitches, I've reduced my presser foot pressure to zero. This allows the feed dogs to still pull the quilt through, but it allows it to go through a little bit smoother and more even so that it's easy to twist and push the quilt underneath the machine. Once I've quilted kind of away from the center spiral and I can kind of give myself a little bit of room, I'm going to spray that marked area so that that will all go away. And then I can just use the previous line of stitching as a guideline to keep going. My stitch length is set to regular straight stitching and I've increased my stitch length to 3.0 to make up for friction and drag on the quilt. Now for the rest of this quilting video, it's going to pretty much look like the same thing. I am rotating the quilt, stitching a wavy line around and around and around. Another feature that really helps on my machine is I've got the hover feature engaged. Basically what this does is once I stop stitching, the needle is in the down position and the foot pops up slightly, allowing me to use both of my hands to turn the quilt. I don't have to stop and use a hand to lift the presser foot up. If you have a knee lift, that really helps as well. It's kind of like the same thing. So in this close-up view, I am just scrunching and smooshing under the machine. I do have 10 inches of space to work with, so that does make it a little bit easier to push this quilt through, but you can successfully do this on a smaller machine. It's just gonna be more stopping and more rotating. Here's a detail shot of what that yummy quilting texture looks like after a few rounds of quilting around the quilt. And this is a still shot, kind of an overhead shot, showing what it actually looks like at my machine. Right now I'm stitching at actual speed, but I will go ahead and speed it up a little bit so you can see the method and the technique without having to wait for every little stitch to happen. Notice as I quilt how I'm keeping the area in between my hands nice and flat. It has a tendency to bunch up as I'm rotating the quilt the entire time. And you'll notice that the, the further out I get from the center, the more I can stitch before I have to rotate. In the very beginning, I was rotating quite a lot. And as the design ripples out, I can quilt more before having to rotate. But again, it's not a problem to rotate the entire quilt as I go. If you want to space your lines further apart, you can use a guide bar or you can change your needle position to give you a little more room and conversely if you want to make your lines closer together you can move your needle position or use a narrower foot but the important thing is that edge of the foot keeps you going in the right direction so again what i'm doing is i'm using the left edge of my foot as a guide and i'm just wiggling and waving and following the pattern all the way around it can get a little bit tedious, but this actually goes very quickly. So I just pop in something to listen to, maybe an audiobook or a fun quilty podcast as I go. Now this is a wider view showing what it actually looks like as I'm rotating and scrunching and smushing. You'll notice the quilt behind me is my churn dash slide. Make sure you check out the video showing how I quilted that one if you haven't seen it yet. And I've got a couple quilts behind me. I'm stitching this on my Krista cabinet with Arrow. I basically designed this cabinet specifically for domestic machine quilters. You'll see that there's a lot of room to work. 
my sewing machine drops down into the table, creating a nice flat area. And probably the most important part are the little bumpers that go all the way around the edges. Those quilt blocks can actually be attached to any table that's less than an inch thick, and they really prevent the quilt from falling off the edges. Super important when you're dealing with a big quilt or when you're rotating around and around like I am. Now this is what it looks like from my point of view as I'm stitching and here's some more detail as I'm stitching around and around and around. This is kind of a methodical design. It's very forgiving and very carefree and it's one of those things that you can just kind of quilt mindlessly and think about other things but it really really ends up looking good. Now I mentioned I'm using my Stitchy Fabric Collection in these really bright and colorful prints and that gray thread that I'm using is just going to give a nice blending texture on top of it. One of my tips when I teach machine quilting is to use busy prints, especially when you're practicing your machine quilting, because they really hide any of your imperfections. But you know what? As long as your quilt is loved and used, that's all that matters. The more you use it, the more you wash it, the more loved it will become, and it'll just cuddle up so nicely. The pattern actually comes in a couple of sizes, so you can play around with it, you know, and make it bigger or smaller if you want to. Here's even more of a detail where you can see, again, the side of that foot going next to the previous line of stitching. Earlier, I showed you that all of my seams were pressed open when I quilted the top, and that really makes a difference so that my foot and needle don't get hung up on any intersections where the seams come together. I'm quilting my quilt rather densely and it's all going to hold together nicely. One other tip I wanted to mention, I mentioned that I'm using a natural fiber batting which is cotton and wool. My fabric is cotton and my thread is cotton. Using those natural fibers help everything cling together and it provides nice stitch definition and nice drape. And the most important thing is it prevents puckers because the batting clings to the quilt the thread glides nicely over the quilt top and it all works together in a wonderful harmony. And again, there's kind of an in-progress shot of my sewing machine with the quilt on top of it. Once the quilting is done, it just provides amazing, yummy texture. I always try to make sure that my lines are not lined up perfect because it gives an organic texture and it allows you to see the hand of the maker. This is what I call handcrafted machine quilting. I photographed it outside to show off those brilliant colors and I'm pleased with how it turned out. Well, I sure hope you enjoyed watching me quilt this quilt. You can do the same thing. You can get the sparkling stars pattern and you can either use my stitchy fabrics, just as I've shown here, or you can pull different fabrics that you want. You can make it in a completely different way. If you do make it, I sure would love to see a picture of it. You can tag me anywhere on social media at Krista Quilts. It sure makes my day when I see what you're up to. And you know what? I am your quilting cheerleader here to help you every step of the way. Until next time, happy quilting. Mm -hmm.